not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk, as they say. He doesn't want us just to be hearers of his word, but he wants us to be doers of his word. Highest form of worship for a believer is obedience. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Well, tonight we have a very important lesson, uh, the theme of which is about really following Jesus. And it's called the goal of the godly. The theme of our study tonight is about how do we really follow Jesus? And our story springs from one of the great characters in the New Testament, one of my heroes, and that would be Peter, the apostle. When he first appears in the Bible, Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee and he sees there's Peter and Andrew and James and John and they're cleaning their nets. And Jesus says, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. Well, they decided to follow Jesus. Of course, they had a little concern about income. And on one occasion, Jesus said, push your net out and push your boat out and put your net down for a catch. And the haul of fish was so great, they couldn't fit it in both boats. And Peter, realizing he was a sinful man, he fell down and said, Lord Jesus, you need to depart from me because I am a sinful man. Jesus said, Peter, don't be afraid. Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. So he began to follow Jesus. I guess I relate to Peter because Peter was always ready to speak before he thought. Any of you ever feel like that? Sometimes you say something, you know, oh, I should have thought first. Peter was the first one to speak among the apostles in almost every situation. Jesus said, who are men say that I am? Peter said, I know, I know. And when Jesus is walking on the water, Peter says, Lord, let me come to you. <laughs> he was always the first one. And you know, God could use that later to help him preach at Pentecost. But when Peter went walking to Jesus on the water, he wanted to see if his friends were watching. Peter loved Jesus and he wanted to follow Jesus, but he also was worried about what the crowd thought. And as he was walking out there, his eyes were on Jesus, he was doing the impossible, he was walking on water, and he thought, well, I wonder if the guys are getting this on video. He still couldn't stop thinking about if his friends were watching. And when he looked back to say, hey guys, catch this, he took his eyes off Jesus and he saw the waves and the storm and the darkness and he began to sink. And he prayed the shortest prayer in the Bible. Three words, Lord save me. Jesus forgave him, reached down, picked him back up again. You know, even if you follow Jesus, you may take your eyes off and sink, turn back to Christ right away. Say, Lord save me. Peter was always wanting to be close to Jesus when Jesus was performing miracles, when he was casting out devils. He'd say, yep, yep, I'm, I'm, he's my friend. I'm with Jesus. And he's very excited about that. But a little later, when Jesus was in the upper room at the Lord's Supper, he said, tonight, all of you are going to forsake me and betray me. And Peter said, these guys might forsake you, Lord, but not moi. He said, I'll die for you. Jesus said in John 13, 38, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Peter didn't know how much of a follower he really was of the crowd. Now, he was sincere because when Judas came to arrest Jesus with the mob, Peter was the first one to pull out a sword and try to defend Jesus. As long as Peter was surrounded by his friends and he could see Jesus, he was, he was game for a fight. But a little, a little while later, when Christ was being tried, and a young girl came up and began to mock him and say, oh, you're one of his followers, aren't you? He began to be intimidated, and he said, I don't know who he is. And before the rooster crowed twice, three times, he began to swear and curse, Matthew 26, 74, and say, I don't know the man. How could somebody change so quickly? Peter was worried about what the crowd was going to think. The crowd had changed, everyone was mocking Jesus, and it affected him. Now, the reason I emphasize this is because, friends, when we enter the last days, being a Bible Christian is going to be unpopular. Did you know that? And you need to know how to fix your eyes on Jesus and walk close with Jesus, even if everyone else seems to forsake him. And you need to know that if it's in the Bible, 
It's the truth. And you can trust the truth. Question number one, how does God determine whether or not we're on his side? The answer is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus said, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does, doeth the will of my Father in heaven. It's not just saying, it's not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk, as they say. He doesn't want us just to be hearers of his word, but he wants us to be doers of his word. Highest form of worship for a believer is obedience. And God wants us to, by his grace, do what he's asking us to do. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. The apostle Paul says here, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And so if people say, Lord, Lord, once a week in church, but then the rest of the week they're really serving the devil, Jesus is going to say to them, I don't know you when he comes. And this is the message of the Bible. Jesus said it is more than just saying, Lord, Lord. It's doing his will, following him. And the devil has a lot of people that are held captive. And the Bible says, whoever you obey, that's whose servants you are. The reason our world is in trouble right now is because our early parents surrendered dominion to the arch fiend villain called the devil when God said, obey me, eat from this tree and you'll live. Do not eat from the forbidden tree. The devil said, don't listen to God, listen to me. And when Adam and Eve decided, we're not going to listen to God, we're going to listen to the devil, they basically surrendered the world that God had made for them. And Jesus calls the devil the prince of this world. That's why there's this titanic battle between good and evil in the world. Christ has come into our world so that he could redeem those who are willing to be redeemed, but he will not force himself on anyone. You must invite him into your life. You must choose him. You can't force someone to love you. Number two, when the commands of God and men are at odds, when they conflict, who did Peter say we should obey if there's a conflict between the two? Acts 5, 29, this is the new Peter after his conversion. And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I'm hoping I have that kind of love and faith for the Lord so that no matter how the world may threaten us, we're going to stick to our convictions biblically. Give a thus saith the Lord for what we believe. Number three, how do we best demonstrate our love for God? John 8, 31, Jesus said, if you continue in my what? my word, then you're my disciples indeed. It's not just Lord, Lord. It's not just belonging to a church membership. He said, are you walking in, continuing in my word? And so it's, it's being not a hearer, but a doer of the word. That's why we're teaching and preaching these principles of the truth. And one of my favorite verses we've repeated before, John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you what? If you love the Lord, keep his commandments. James 2, 10, he says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in five points. Is that what it says? One point. He's guilty of all. So the Lord wants us to be consistent in keeping his commandments. The Ten Commandments are not multiple choice. Deuteronomy 5.29, God says, Oh, that my people would have such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all of my commandments always that it might be well with them and their children forever. That's a wonderful verse. Why? Does he want us to obey all always? That it might be well. When we sin, we have problems, don't we? Doesn't sin cause problems? Number four, is it generally safe to follow the crowd? Now we're still on the same theme. Exodus chapter 23, verse 2, it says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Is the crowd usually right or wrong? And not always, but often the crowd is making the wrong decision. You can read again in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. And that word straight there means the difficult, the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And what? Many are the ones that go in thereat. 
It goes on to say, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life and few there be that find it. You know, in Bible times, <clears throat> cities were often built on hills and enemy armies would come and they'd see them in the distance. It was hard to sneak up back then. You'd see all the clouds of dust and the thunder of the horses. Trumpet would blow and people would, from the suburbs and the farms, they would go to the city for a defense. And if everybody wanted to take all of their stuff in the wagons, they'd take the wide road that went through the big gate on the wide way. But if people wanted to go straight up the hill and sometimes they'd go through a narrow gate, they'd get there a lot quicker and they could get inside the city before the enemy arrived. People that would get involved in the traffic jams wouldn't make it in time and they'd be overtaken by the enemy. And Jesus was saying, you can't go on the road with everybody else if you want to get into the kingdom. It's a broad road. The majority are going to go down the wrong road. The majority are going to follow the false prophets. The majority are going to be going through the wide gate to destruction. You got to make up your mind to follow Jesus. He was unconventional that way. 1 Peter 3 verse 20. He, another verse on that theme. In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, wherein many are saved, or few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, no, I don't want to discourage you. It's going to be more than eight people saved. <laughs> Some people have wondered, Pastor Doug, is it only the 144,000 that will be saved? No, there will be plenty more saved. The 144,000 are kind of like last day apostles. Upper room, there were 12 apostles plus 120. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out and 3,000 were baptized from their ministry. So that 144,000 number is representing a group of leadership, kind of like last day apostles there'll be many more saved and there's room for you. It's not like God is up there in the sky going, you know, I've only got so much room in heaven and he looks down on earth and goes, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'll save you, eeny, meeny, miny. There's room for you. What's going to make the decision? Whosoever will. Choose you this day who you will serve. If you want to serve the Lord, you can. God has given you a free choice. You can make a decision. That's why you're at these meetings. Holy Spirit brought you here. Holy Spirit has you watching right now because God wants you to be in the kingdom. But you need to make a decision and say, Lord, I'm going to surrender it to you. Question number five. How does Jesus feel when we put the traditions of men before the commandments of God? And these are the words of Christ. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and verse 9. How be it in what? Vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We've got to make up our mind. Are we going to follow the commandments of God? A lot of people might be very sincere in worshiping God the wrong way, and Jesus said, in vain they worship me. So we don't want to worship them in vain, do we? Amen? Amen. And he goes on, he says, and unto them, he said, full well you reject the commandment of God, that you might keep your what? Your own tradition. You know, when you learn the truth about state of the dead, it's a change in your thinking. When you learn the truth about hell, it's a change in your thinking. When people learn the truth about the Sabbath, that's a revolutionary change. You know why? Some people it might mean, well, maybe I need to be going to a church that keeps the Sabbath. That could mean a change in friends. That, that could mean I need to change my work schedule. That could mean and it really means commitment. It's like the story about the, the chicken and the pig got together and they decided to do something nice for the farmer. And the chicken said, why don't we make him a ham and eggs breakfast? <laughs> and the pig said to the chicken, he said, well, for you, it's a contribution. For me, it's total commitment. <laughs> and so being a Christian is a total commitment. Number six. Is it possible to serve both God and the crowd? No. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Jesus says also in Matthew 12, verse 30, He that is not with me is against me. Now you might be thinking, Jesus, that sounds pretty... I don't have very many options. That's right, there's two. Life and death. Christ and the devil. Straight gate to heaven, broad road to destruction. Jesus said there's only two options. 
Live for yourself, self-destruct. Live for Christ, you gain everything. It is more blessed to give than receive. And if you live a life of I'm going to live for God, I'm going to want to serve Him, I want a spiritual life, that is the abundant life that Jesus is offering you. But there's no third option. Is it safe to love a friend or a family member more than Jesus? Now this is where it gets a little difficult. It's personal. Matthew 10, verse 37, Christ said, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, when a person hears the truth and they make a decision to follow Jesus, there's sometimes resistance from people in the family. When I decided to be a Christian, you know, that didn't go very well with my Jewish family. Matter of fact, they told me at first, they said, we would have liked it better if you'd become a Buddhist. <laughs> but for, you know, because uh, my Jewish side of the family, they said, Christians are the ones that have persecuted us through history. They call us Christ killers. We get all kinds of grief from Christians. If you had become a Buddhist, it would have been better. And I married Karen. They said, you married a Goyim girl. And, uh, but then they came to love her. And they finally ca actually came to church to hear me preach, my Jewish family. But there was some resistance from the family. My father, he said, Doug, religion is a crutch for weak people, he said as he continued drinking his martini. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell Dad, you got your crutches too. And I admit I am weak. We do need Jesus. And so, you know, you'll have people that are close. The devil will often use those closest to you. When the devil came to Job, after Job lost his possessions and he lost his health and he lost his children and he's trying to cling to just threads of faith that he's got in God, the devil had Job's wife come and say, why don't you just give up, curse God and die? The one closest to him. Now she may have been a good woman, but she got discouraged that day. And the devil sometimes will even use those in your family. You cannot, you know, some people have said, Pastor Doug, I, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. I'm going to join the church. I'm going to get baptized. But I'm waiting for my wife. I'm waiting for my husband. And, you know, once they make a decision, well, it might be okay if you wait a little bit, but you wait too long. The best thing you can do for your family is you put Jesus first and you tell them this is between you and Jesus, but I've made my decision. I'm following Jesus. I hope you join me. Luke 14, verse 26, Jesus said, If any man comes after me and doesn't hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children. And the word there, hate, means love less. It's kind of the King James translation. And his brethren and sisters, yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Christ is being pretty clear. What place does he want in our life? First, because everyone you love, who gives them to you? What are you going to love, the gift or the giver? Everything else is a gift from God. So why would you love the gift more than the one who gave you the gift? Put him first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Don't let anybody come between you and your God. There's nobody in this world who can give you heaven. So don't let them confuse you. Only Jesus can give you that and you follow him. Matthew 12, 50. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. You want to be part of Christ's family? What did Jesus say? Whoever is doing the will of God, I am adopting you into my family. By the way, what is the will of God? Psalm 40. Yea, I love to do your will. Your law is within my heart. The will of God is the law of God. The new covenant is the law of God written in the heart. And Jesus said we become part of his family. The Apostle John says, 1 John chapter 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. That'd be sons and daughters. He's adopting us into his family. Is it wise to put a prosperous career or earthly treasures before Jesus? Matthew 16, verse 26. For what is a man profited if he will gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Luke 12, verse 15. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. You do not see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You cannot take it with you. 
As Job said, naked I came into this world and naked I'll leave. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And so what's the treasure? What's the real treasure that we store in heaven? People. The only thing going to heaven, lives that are transformed by the power of God. Your stuff's not going. Is it safe to continue disobeying God's will after he's shown you the truth? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. For if we sin willfully, how? After we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of fiery indignation that will devour the adversaries. Now it doesn't mean if you slip and fall after you've received the truth. It means if you choose to live a life of sin after God has given you a knowledge of the truth, there's nothing more the Lord can do. He sends us truth to bless us and save us, but it's not just hearing the truth. We've got to walk in the light as He is in the light. Amen? I remember doing a meeting like this and uh, someone who had studied for the priesthood came to the meetings. And you know there's a lot of things that a person who had gone to Catholic school and studied for the priesthood, they come to a meeting like this, they hear the Reformation truths. And I remember one night he just stormed out and I thought, oh, I'm afraid we may not see that brother again. And before I could even call him, he came back the next night and he talked to me after the meeting. And he said, you know, I was so angry and I went home and I just prayed and prayed and said, Lord, am I angry because it's the truth or am I angry because he's wrong? And he said, I started searching the Bible. I said, Lord, you've got to show me. And the Lord showed him and reinforced the scriptures that we had been sharing. And he said, you know, I just need to come and tell you that, that this was the biggest struggle of my life, but I am so happy I came. But that man was, he stayed up all night long reading the Bible, praying, crying, because he realized things he had believed sincerely all his life were just wrong. I remember when I first heard it, and I thought, how can that be? How could so many people be wrong? And I realized, you know, what do you expect? Did you expect the truth to be popular in this kind of world? The devil's doing all he can to hide and obscure the truth, and Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. Does following Jesus involve some struggles and self-denial? Yeah, this is what the Lord told us would happen. Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, every day, and follow me. Every day I pray in the morning. And you want to say, Lord, not my will, your will be done. I want to serve you today. You've, we've all got these, everyone has a battle inside. Jesus said, The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. We all have this battle between our spiritual nature that wants to do God's will and our carnal, selfish nature that wants to do the things of the world and follow the devil's temptation. And there's like a tug of war going on. It's almost like a political campaign. The Lord has voted for you, and the devil has voted against you, and you got the tie breaking vote. You got to make up your mind I'm going to go with the Lord today. Amen. Daily, you deny yourself, take up your cross, and that's when you find your life. Christ said, Whoever seeks to save his life for themselves, you lose it. But whoever will let go of his life for my sake in the Gospels, you find it. What benefits come as a result of accepting and following the truth? Well, there's a lot of them. For one thing, Psalm 119, verse 165, the Bible says, Great, what? Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing will offend them. Why am I sharing these things about the law? Because I'm legalistic? Or because I want you to have the joy and the peace that Jesus promises? I'm doing it because the Bible does it. You just don't hear these things anymore because it involves some self-denial. Great peace. Again, John 8, verse 32. Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and what will the truth do? Make you free. There's a power in the truth that sets you free. It helps you have context and purpose for life. And the Lord wants you to have that. Now, friends, there's only two choices. It's life and death, blessing and cursing, good and evil, and the Lord has shown us that he loves us and he wants us to have that life that he came to give. Jesus left the glories of heaven. He came to this world. God became a man to die on our behalf to save us. He suffered like we'll never be able to comprehend on the cross. And he's saying, I want you to live with me through eternity, but you must choose to follow me. The truth of Jesus is revealed in his word. That's what we've been sharing with you during this seminar. I hope, friends, that you'll make a decision tonight to receive a love of the truth because the truth will set you free. Amen? Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Can't get enough amazing facts Bible study? 
You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. Did you know this boat could share the gospel with 20,000 people? Or a car like this one could reach 10,000 souls seeking hope in Jesus? If you have a vehicle you're not using and would like to reach hearts for the kingdom of God, prayerfully consider donating your vehicle to Amazing Facts today. It's easy to turn your unneeded car, boat, RV, motorcycle, even ATVs and jet skis into a soul-winning vehicle for Christ and get a tax deduction. Amazing Facts will arrange to pick up your vehicle and provide you with a tax-deductible receipt. The proceeds from the resale will be used to share God's truth with millions of people around the world. Don't leave your vehicle in the garage collecting dust. Use it to transform lives through Amazing Facts. Contact us today and let us help turn your car, boat, RV, or motorcycle into lives saved for Christ. I began reading the Bible. I got baptized into Seventh Day. I realized that there had to be more to life. God is really doing this. The life that He's given. This message was so powerful. Christ wherever He goes. Amazing facts. More than 45 years of proclaiming God's message around the world. Virtually all Christians agree that Jesus is coming back, but there's a lot of confusion about how He's coming back. Christ warned us, take heed that no man deceive you. There'll be false Christs and false prophets. So how can we avoid being deceived? Is the Lord coming like lightning shining from the east to the west, or is the rapture going to be a secret? Would you like to know the truth? We have a free study we'd like to send you. All you have to do is ask for it. It's called The Secret Rapture, and it explains the whole subject. Go to amazingfacts.org or call the number on your screen and ask for offer number 180. And when you get this free resource, make sure and read it and then share it with someone else because God's message is our mission. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. Jonah realized he nearly killed everyone on that ship because he was running from God. Have you ever considered your decision to serve God or run from God not only affects you, but it will affect people around you? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. It's hard to believe that um, this is the tenth and final presentation in this series, and we hope that the Word of God has touched your lives and you will continue to study because that's where the power is. And so in our Heroes of Faith presentation, tonight we're going to be talking about the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah. What is that? Now I know there are probably some skeptics out there that are saying, Pastor Doug, uh, you can't really take the book of Jonah seriously. Well, I do because Jesus did. Uh, Jesus stated it very emphatically that he believed the book of Jonah was real, and he said there's things that we can learn from the experience and the story of Jonah that can help us in our lives today. Now, you might be thinking, how is he a hero of faith? Stay with me. Go to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah... The word Jonah, by the way, means dove. The son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now God said, Jonah, you're a prophet. I've got a work for you to do. I want you to go prophesy. I want you to go east to Nineveh 
and talk to the wicked people in that great city, tell them that they are going to be judged for their sins. But you have to know that the people of Nineveh didn't get along very well with the people of Israel any more than they do today. And can you imagine an Orthodox Jew dressed as an Orthodox Jew walking through downtown Saudi Arabia telling them all they're wicked and God is going to destroy them? They might not last very long. So Jonah, you could understand his reluctance. Not only that, they had been persecuted. It was Assyria that carried away 10 of the tribes. They had been persecuted by the Assyrians and last thing Jonah wanted to do was go warn them so they repent. He kind of thought, well, if God's going to judge them, I'm not going anywhere. Let them judge them. They were the avowed enemies of Israel. And so God told him to go east. Instead, he went west. Maybe Jonah was thinking, well, you know, the Lord, it was a suggestion. No, it wasn't a suggestion. God's will told him what to do, but he didn't want to do what the word of the Lord told him to do. The word of the Lord, furthermore, said, arise. God's word elevates. But Jonah didn't want to do it, and it says he went down. He arose to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. Can you flee from God's presence? Isn't that silly? You would think that at least a theologian like a prophet would know that. But who knows? Maybe Jonah was thinking to himself, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go down to Joppa. That's where the seaport was. And if it turns out that there are any ships going to Tarshish, I'll take that as a sign from the Lord that it's okay that I go. So he gets to Joppa, and sure enough, there are ships in the harbor getting ready to depart the next day. He says, Lord, I'm going to throw out another fleece. Um, if it turns out they've got room for one more passenger, then I'll take it as a sign. It's okay for me not to do what you're saying. Sure enough, he asked. They said that they had room. And his conscience is still bothering him. So Jonah said, Lord, one more thing. If it turns out I've got enough money for the fare, then that'll be a sign you're going to let me off the hook and I don't have to talk to the Assyrians. Sure enough, they told him how much it was. It was just enough. By the way, it costs you to run from God. So he paid the fare. And it was even nice sailing weather. So he figured, you know, even though the word of the Lord told me, I don't really want to do it, and God's just going to, we're, we're going to ignore it, and it'll go away. Has God ever told you something he wanted you to do or didn't want you to do, and you think because the sun keeps shining and the birds keep singing that it must be okay that you continue to live in disobedience? I have met people before. I remember counseling with a, a man and a woman. They just left their spouses and got together. They were living in an adulterous relationship. And they said, but you know, Pastor Doug, we just, those other marriages were a mistake. They're still married to these other people. And we just see how God is blessing. And it seems like everything is going better now. And we have peace, and it must be God's will. I said, what about the word of the Lord that says, thou shalt not commit adultery? And they wanted to skip over that part because they had all this circumstantial evidence that it was okay. Well, Jonah thought, you know, that just by the way, friends, if you didn't catch it, we can convince ourselves to believe whatever we want to believe, and the devil will give you a thousand rationalizations to do what you want to do that may not be the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord said, Jonah, go east, preach. You're a preacher, that's what I want you to do. He didn't want to. Whatever his reasons were, he didn't want to. So he's going the other direction. He's fleeing from the presence of the Lord, but... The Lord sent out a great wind. Now, this was a sailing season. It was supposed to be good. Everything looked fine. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship was about to be broken up. And the mariners were afraid. And every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo into the sea, even though it was a great loss, because they thought, what's more than life? What is worth more than life? And they're praying and then it says, but again, the sailors are praying, the sailors are sacrificing, these are the pagans, but the Jew, who is supposed to know God and know the truth, he's down in the lowest part of the ship, and he's fast asleep. So the captain comes below deck, he's looking around for anything else they can throw overboard, and he finds a snoring hypocrite. He comes to him, and he says, verse 6, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God, 
perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish the very same words that were spoken to Jesus. Master, carest thou not that we are perishing? So they said to one another, they, he comes up deck and he's rubbing his eyes and going, oh no, I was afraid of this. He knows right away when he sees this howling storm. It's a supernatural storm that came out of nowhere. Jonah knows in his heart that smooth sailing was just, God was giving him time to repent and he waited. And they said to one another, come let us cast lots that we might know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, very quickly, what that was in Bible times, they had a way, it's like drawing straws. They would have like a, a jar that had a narrow opening, and they would put all of these black stones in there and one white stone, depending on how many people they were casting lots with. They'd shake it, kind of like a lottery. They'd put their thumb over it, and they'd, they'd drop out one stone, and whoever got the white stone, you were the one that was busted. You were the one that picked. And one by one, they're going around, and probably Jonah was the last one, and out comes the white stone, and they all look at him. And he looks up, and he knows he's been running from the Word of God. Matter of fact, he fesses up. They, they said to him, please tell us. They're all firing questions at him. For whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Now, usually when the, weather's not, when the weather's bad, you don't turn to the person next to you and say, what did you do? right? But this is no small storm. This is like a supernatural storm, and the boat is creaking and groaning with every new wave, and they figure any moment it's going to bust the smithereens. What, what is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? For what are your people? They're just firing questions out, and finally he says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land, right? When he says, and he's the God that made the sea. See, they had all these different gods, and he wanted to be clear, I worship the God that made everything all your gods are made out of. I worship the God of gods. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. You know, after they woke up Jesus, and he calmed the sea, it says they were exceedingly afraid. Then they were exceedingly afraid and said, why did you do this? Good question. Why would you run from God? The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from God. Would God ever ask you to do something that is ultimately bad? Think about that. Why would you not do His will then if God will never ask you to do something bad? Because we don't trust Him? Or we worship our ideas more than God? Why did you do this? He never gives an answer. For the men knew that He fled from the presence of the Lord because He told them. And then they said to Him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. The longer they waited, it looked like they were running out of time. Every time the boat went down in the trough of a wave, more water came in, and they were probably bailing with all their might, and still the boat was getting lower and lower in the water, and it looked like the next wave was going to be the last one. And Jonah said something peculiar. Pick me up, verse 12, throw me into the sea, then the sea will be calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Throw me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to land, but they could not. They're being washed further and further out to sea. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord. They knew the next wave was going to be their last, and they thought, what have we got to lose? They cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. God so loved us that he gave his son that we might not perish because Jesus gave his life. Do not charge us with innocent blood. You know what Pilate said at the trial of Christ? I don't want to be guilty of this man's innocent blood. Were they casting lots at the cross? Were they casting lots for Jonah? Jesus said, no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. For you have done, O Lord, as it pleased you. You read the prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 53, and it says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him for our sake. Lord, you've done as it pleased you. So, was Jonah a willing sacrifice? He said, You must throw me overboard. And they got six men or so, and they each grabbed the hands and the feet of Jonah, and they said, One, and they swung him out, back, two, they swung him a little further, three, 
hurled him over the side. And when he hit the water, instantly the waves began to flatten out. And the wind stopped like it had put on brakes. And there was a great calm. The sea ceased from its raging. Did Jesus calm the sea? Does Jonah calm the sea? No sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Do you remember when Jesus calmed the sea? I already talked about this, but here it says it again. The men feared the Lord exceedingly and sacrificed to the Lord and took vows. When Jesus calmed the sea, they said, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Then it goes on to say, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, and it swallowed Jonah. This is one of the reasons Jonah is something of a hero for me. At what point do you give up and think there's no more hope? I mean, if I was in the storm, and I know this storm has happened, and these guys throw me overboard, I would think, oh, well, I'm getting what I deserve. If someone's got to go, it's got to be me. All this trouble happened to them because I'm running from God. Jonah realized he nearly killed everyone on that ship because he was running from God. Have you ever considered your decision to serve God or run from God not only affects you, but it will affect people around you? Christ has made it very clear that your decision to run from Him or to follow Him will react and react again in saving or destroying lives around you. No man is an island. And if you make it to the kingdom, you will see on the streets of gold, people that were no doubt influenced by your positive decision. And if you're in the lake of fire and it creeps up around your ankles, you will see people that were influenced by your decision. What kind of decision, what kind of influence are you having? Jonah realized they're, they're being lost, they're perishing because I'm running from God. I would have given up at that point. But Jonah now, he's going on this unscheduled tour inside this sea monster you want to know who the first submariner was in the world? That would be Jonah. But they didn't give him a porthole. And so, and you know, I've often thought, if Jonah was alive inside the fish, what if the fish had some hors d'oeuvres before Jonah? <laughs> you know, have a few jellyfish. You ever been stung by a jellyfish? I have. It hurts have a few sea urchins and some octopus to, you know, get the little stickers on you in the dark there inside the fish digestive system, surrounded by all that sushi <laughs> in the dark, little bioluminescent things flashing, <laughs> what's that, you know, sea urchins jabbing you. It must have been miserable. I know we're joking about it, but can you imagine how miserable that was? It's describing the sufferings of Jesus. Three days and three nights, but Jonah, even in that, he prayed from the bottom of the mountains. Now, if there's a place you can run where God can't hear your prayers, it would not be Joppa or Tarshish or Timbuktu. But I think if you're inside a whale in the dark at the bottom of the mountains, that would be about as far away from God as you could get. Can you picture geographically any way to hide better from God than to try to sneak off in the digestive system of a fish at the bottom of the mountains and see maybe you'll forget about me? If, you know, this is just wonderful because if God could hear Jonah's prayer from there, is there hope for you? And yet from that predicament, jo Jonah prayed and he had to pray patiently. Sometimes your prayers aren't answered right away. If I was in that, I'd say, Lord, help me now. <laughs> An hour later, I'd say, how long, oh Lord? And a day later, I'd say, I don't know if I can last much longer. Probably didn't sleep very well. Was Jonah in trouble because of what someone else did or what he did to himself? Don't we often get into trouble by making bad decisions? And yet, in spite of the fact he caused his own misery, God could have said, look, you made your bed, sleep in it. But he prayed and God forgave him. And the Bible says, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah on dry land. God is so good. He could have burped him out and made him swim to shore. <laughs> but once he forgave him, he brought him up special delivery. He gave a God-inspired heave and out came Jonah. And I heard one pastor say, that just goes to show you a hypocrite will even make a sea monster sick.
Now Jonah's thinking, wow, that was something I will never forget. That made a memory. Now I'm going to go back home. I need a little R&R &R after this experience. But before Jonah even dried off, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Now, does God modify his message? Or is it identical to the word the first time? And he said, arise. You know, when Jonah runs, he goes down. When God's word comes, it says, arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I will tell you. So does Jonah argue now? He figures, look, I'd rather die in Nineveh than go back to sea. So he arose and he fled to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days journey. And Jonah began to enter the city the first day's walk. Now Jonah, I guess he must have been pretty scary because he went to Nineveh and he started preaching. He walked up and down the streets. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And instead of them killing him, he probably had that wild look in his eyes as a guy that had just been through a fish. <laughs> probably had a little octopus tentacle sticking out of his coat and, you know, looked like he'd been bleached. And You've been through an experience like that and you look different. <laughs> and, you know, God's prophets already, you know, they wore camel skin and leather belts and were a little wild. And here Jonah now has just gone through that. And he says, 40 days. And he goes up and he camps on the hill. Next day, 39 days, 38 days. People in Nineveh are beginning to get convicted. You know, we are pretty wicked. If I was God, I'd destroy me too. And pretty soon it reaches the king that there's this Jewish prophet pronouncing judgment. 25 days, 24. And you know, that would be unnerving as he did his countdown every day, going up and down the streets, saying judgment is coming because of your sins. The king pronounces a proclamation and man and beast repent. They put sackcloth on man and beast. They don't eat. They don't drink. And there is the greatest revival and turning to God that is seen anywhere in the Bible from the most reluctant evangelist in the Bible. And you wonder if God can use you. Jonah didn't even want to preach. It's the shortest sermon. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Pretty short sermon. But when you get the Spirit of God, and if the Lord tells you to go, He will prepare the hearts ahead of time. The whole city turns from their sin. The whole city repents. And there are hundreds of thousands of people in the city. And then Jonah goes up on the hill. I'm summarizing the story for you. He goes up on the hill. And when he gets counting down after his last message, he's made a little booth up on the hill, and he's watching he wants to see fire come down on Nineveh like it did on Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, all right, Lord, I warned him. I went through a lot. Now here comes judgment. And after the 40th day, nothing happens. He waits another day. Nothing happens. Now Jonah is feeling like, now I really look like a hypocrite. Instead of rejoicing that God has shown them mercy because they repented, doesn't that tell us that God is more willing to save God's not just wanting to judge people. He's wanting to save people. Now, amazing thing about the story of Jonah, everybody in the story of Jonah is listening to God except Jonah. The storm listens to God. The fish listens to God. The sailors listen to God. The captain listens to God. It says even the people of Nineveh, they listen to God. And there's this great revival, there's this great repentance, and the one who's the most difficult in the whole story is Jonah. God called Jonah with a work to do to save others. And sometimes, human nature, we're reluctant to do what God is calling us to do. And when Jonah ran from the will of God, it went very badly. And it not only went badly for him, it went badly for those around him. And when Jonah surrendered to the word of God and went to do what God told him to do, people that were doomed were saved. Once Jonah surrendered to the Lord in that boat, and he said, I'm the cause, throw me overboard, the sailors found peace. When Jonah surrendered and he went to Nineveh, a whole city found peace. And God had to reason with Jonah in the end of the book. 
He said, Should not I have pity on Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 people who don't know the difference between their right hand and their left hand? No one was worried because his gourd plant died. That was giving him shade. He didn't care. Sometimes we're more concerned with our daily inconveniences with the, than with the millions of people around us that are lost. Now, you know why I saved this message for last? We've been talking about the stories, heroes of faith that deal with salvation. We've made several appeals for people to come to Jesus that you might be saved. But why does the Lord want to save us? Why did he save Jonah? He saved him and then said, I've got a mission for you. Go and tell the people that are perishing that they might be saved. The most important thing in life is that you come to God Jesus calls it the great invitation. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He invites us to come to him, but he doesn't stop there. The last thing the Lord says in Matthew 28 is, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. All of life is involved in those two great endeavors. It's like your heart is constantly taking in and it's giving out. And that's how life is. We receive from God and then we give for God. The Great Commission is summed up in our coming to Jesus this is the vertical relationship. And then we go for Jesus. I always feel a little like the Pope when I do that. We come to Jesus and we go for Jesus. But it is. It's the vertical relationship and then it's the horizontal relationship which does form a cross. The cross is talking about love for God. What's the great commandment? Love the Lord with all your heart. And what's the second one? Love your neighbor. And so as we talk night after night about our coming to God, don't stop there. Because if you don't use your Christianity, you lose your Christianity. When God gives you something to do to tell others, don't be afraid. Jonah was afraid. Last thing in the world he expected was the biggest revival in the Bible. I mean, Noah saved eight people. Jonah saved a whole city. And if God could use Jonah as reluctant, you know, he probably wrote the book. So he admitted that... Um, I was a reluctant prophet. He understood what was wrong. If he could use Jonah, can he use us? If he could answer Jonah's prayer, can he answer our prayers? Some of us, like Jonah, have run from God and we're, we might be inside the whale right now, going through some hard times, or going through some struggles. And maybe we need to have one of those experiences like Jonah where we reach the bottom, talk about reaching the bottom, and we say, Lord, and we surrender to him. Jonah made a complete surrender. He was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. And when he did that, God then was able to turn everything around and God was able to use him. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Can't get enough amazing facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at aftv.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. Did you know this boat could share the gospel with 20,000 people? Or a car like this one could reach 10,000 souls seeking hope in Jesus? If you have a vehicle you're not using and would like to reach hearts for the kingdom of God, prayerfully consider donating your vehicle to Amazing Facts today. It's easy to turn your unneeded car, boat, RV, motorcycle, even ATVs and jet skis into a soul-winning vehicle for Christ and get a tax deduction. Amazing Facts will arrange to pick up your vehicle and provide you with a tax-deductible receipt. The proceeds from the resale will be used to share God's truth with millions of people around the world. Don't leave your vehicle in the garage collecting dust. Use it to transform lives through amazing facts. Contact us today and let us help turn your car, boat, RV, or motorcycle into lives saved for Christ. Together, we have spread the gospel much farther than ever before. Thank you for your support. I remember meeting someone that told me, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm just not a practicing Christian. And of course, what they were talking about is they had accepted Christ earlier in their life, and they figured once you're saved, you can't be lost. It doesn't really matter if you're practicing the teachings of Christ 
or following Jesus. Does the Bible really teach that? And once you are saved, can you be lost? How much of a choice do we have and what is meant by predestination? All of these very important issues are answered in this special book, Can a Saved Man Choose to Be Lost? We'd like to send it to your friends for free. Just go to the web address on your screen, amazingfacts.org, or call the phone number there and ask for offer number 112. This is a very difficult study and it's something you owe it to yourself to understand. I can promise you, you'll never be the same and you will be encouraged and comforted by this study. And that's why we do what we do here at Amazing Facts, because God's message is our mission. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. 